Chapter 8 of Days with Great Poets. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Days with Great Poets by May Clarissa Gillington Byron. Chapter 8 A Day with William Morris. O oh, June. O oh, June, that we desired so, Wilt thou not make us happy on this day? Across the river thy soft breezes blow, Sweet with the scent of bean fields far away. The Earthly Paradise His own lines are running in the head of William Morris, As at sunrise, that is to say about three o'clock, on a midsummer morning of 1879, he thrusts his rough dark head out of the open window and sees the river shimmering past between the branches of great elms in fullest leaf. The very breath of June is in the air, full of atoms of summer, and the fertile earth is aglow with warm loveliness. From all the length and breadth of green English shires, to Morris in his house by London River, the voice of beauty calls, and he responds to it. O oh me, O oh me, how I love the earth, he murmurs, and the seasons and weather and all things that deal with it and all that grows out of it, the earth and the growth of it and the life of it. If I could but say or show how I love it, his vagrant thoughts go homing to their dearest goal, that lovely, old-world Kelmscott village in Oxfordshire, after which his present abode is named, beside its far-off lovely mother of the Thames. He loves to think that this same gray, sunlit water which sparkles at his feet has come down to him past the gables and the gardens of Kelmscott, a hundred and thirty miles away. He dreams a moment of those far green meadows, pure and perfect, yet as very Eden. He sees them as he saw the fields in summer dawn. Pray but one prayer for me twixt thy closed lips. Think but one thought of me up in the stars. The summer night waneth, the morning light slips, faint and gray, twixt the leaves of the aspen, betwixt the cloud bars, that are patiently waiting there for the dawn. Patient and colorless, though heaven's gold waits to float through them along with the sun. Far out in the meadows, above the young corn, the heavy elms wait, and restless and cold, the uneasy wind rises. The roses are done. Through the long twilight they pray for the dawn, round the lone house in the midst of the corn. Speak but one word to me over the corn, over the tender bowed locks of the corn. But William Morris is not alone a dreamer of dreams born out of due time, any more than he is the idle singer of an empty day. Essentially, ineradicably, first and foremost, he is a man of action. He has just aroused himself from that sleep of dreamless profundity which he can take, as he puts it, in solid bars, and from which he passes into a waking life of immediate and strenuous energy. He never does anything by halves. In ten minutes he has dressed and started work. His dressing, as may be inferred, is a rough and ready matter. It is indeed effected without the aid of a mirror, for he hates mirrors and will not have any in the house. His rough blue serge is that of a workman, not a literateur, and his general appearance, it must be confessed, is that of a slovenly and unkempt magnificence. His extraordinary and abundant hair, with its thick strong curl, like wrought metal, 
his massive head with its vague inexpressive eyes and beautifully molded mouth his fine build and height dimly indicative of almost superhuman strength his clumsy-looking but exquisitely adroit hands all these traits have combined to produce that rum and indescribable deportment which is at once the delight and despair of his friends he has resolutely turned away from the window switching off so to speak that romantic element which makes one side of his life one long dream and has taken up the other side of his life that steady assiduous unremitting almost stolid laboriousness which has made him the man he is i do not hope to be great at all in anything he wrote in earlier days but perhaps i may reasonably hope to be happy in my work and sometimes when i am idle and doing nothing pleasant visions go past me of the things that may be nowadays it may be said he is never idle mind or hands or both are always busy work has become his ideal his solace his panacea for all ills i tried to think he has declared what would happen to me if i am forbidden my ordinary daily work and i knew that i should die of despair and weariness and indeed it is not easy to see how this strong and passionate man possessed of superabundant vitality and tremendously powerful physique could find an outlet for his exuberant energy except by actual manual labor his loom is set up in his bedroom he is already weaving there now in the first soft light busied upon the lovely warp and woof of his cabbage and vine tapestry sometimes he will stay at this for eight or nine hours sometimes as today other labors claim his attention and he toils all the more resolutely for knowing that his time at the loom must be short in the making and dyeing of textile fabrics william morris has found a means of expression particularly apt to his peculiar modes of thought to him the medieval method is so much the best that it is the only one and not content with reviving medieval romance in his prose and verse he continues to compose as it were in more tangible materials but always with the same underlying idea simplicity of utterance romance of plot gorgeous pageantry of color these are characteristic of his work both in words and in things to make the common as though it were not common an ideal which has been already expounded in the art of the pre-raphaelite brotherhood is a fair definition of the unusual quality which suffuses all the achievements of william morris and even as in the earthly paradise the lambent rosy light the misty lunar atmosphere shot with faint auroral colors the low and magical music the ever-varying panorama of poetical description and passion and thought have struck an entirely new note in english poetry so the same words very nearly may be used with reference to the material effect wrought out by william morris in the field of decorative and textile art you cannot think of him as a poet without considering him as the master craftsman the designer the architect the weaver the dyer the artisan artist in excelsis he is able to express in one art it would appear that which the technique of another denies him he can create a new atmosphere in his poems but in textiles he can it is said create new colors amethyst with tender flushings of red and gold which take on the tincture of a sunset sky and blues so cunningly intermingled with green that no existing color name may define them 
This poignant joy in color has always been his. It is conspicuous in his earlier poems, where splashes of splendid primary hues are almost the raison d'etre of certain lyrics. The drawing and the painting are misalesque in their quaint and realistic detail, in such poems as The Sailing of the Sword. Across the empty garden beds, when the sword went out to sea, I scarcely saw my sister's heads bowed each beside a tree. I could not see the castle leads when the sword went out to sea. Alicia wore a scarlet gown when the sword went out to sea, but Ursula's was russet brown. For the mist we could not see the scarlet roofs of the good town when the sword went out to sea. Green holly in Alicia's hand when the sword went out to sea. With sere oak leaves did Ursula stand. Oh, yet alas for me! I did but bear a peeled white wand when the sword went out to sea. O oh, russet brown and scarlet bright, when the sword went out to sea, my sisters wore, I wore but white, red, brown, and white, all three, three damosels, each had a knight, when the sword went out to sea. Or, in that very harmless and spirited ditty, which had once the knack of simply infuriating the grave and precise, two red roses across the moon. The color notes predominate. There was a lady lived in a hall, large in the eyes and slim and tall, and ever she sung from noon to noon, two red roses across the moon. There was a knight came riding by in early spring, when the roads were dry, and he heard that lady sing at the noon, two red roses across the moon. Yet none the more he stopped at all, but he rode a gallop past the hall, and left that lady singing at noon, two red roses across the moon. Because, forsooth, the battle was set, and the scarlet and blue had got to be met. He rode on the spur till the next warm noon, two red roses across the moon. You scarce could see for the scarlet and blue a golden helm or a golden shoe. So he cried, as the fight grew thick at the noon, two red roses across the moon. Verily, then, the gold bore through the huddled spears of the scarlet and blue, and they cried, as they cut them down at the noon, two red roses across the moon. Under the may she stooped to the crown, all was gold, there was nothing of brown, and the horns blew up in the hall at noon, two red roses across the moon. The big dark weaver's lips move silently, and his filmed inscrutable eyes shine faintly with a lambent light. He is thoroughly enjoying himself. No work which cannot be done with pleasure is worth doing. That is one of his cardinal maxims. Time was when anybody that made anything made a work of art beside a useful piece of goods and it gave them pleasure to make it. Whatever I doubt, I have no doubt of that. One of Morris's main objects in life is to bring this simple, long-forgotten truth home to the hearts of his fellow workmen, and how hard a task he finds it. For in modern days, as once in the origins of language, work and pain are synonymous and pleasure is divorced from labor by reason of the tertium quid, which we know as money. But in the manual arts, as in literature, Morris perpetually endeavors to take up and continue the dropped threads of the medieval tradition, when honest labor wore a lovely face, and he denies the superiority of verbal or literary construction over any other. 
all are equal in his eyes that talk of inspiration says he is sheer nonsense there is no such thing it's a mere matter of craftsmanship if a chap can't compose an epic poem while he's weaving tapestry he'd better shut up he'll never do any good at all so now you behold him carrying out his own principle and framing noble phrases in his mind while his deft fingers manipulate the threads of the web having concluded the appointed hours at the loom morris who even during his work has frequently paced to and fro restlessly padding round the room or oscillating between his weft and the window goes down to his study on the ground floor a room of severe simplicity no carpet is there no curtains shelves of plain unpolished oak heavy laden with books cover most of the wall space a square table of the same plain oak carries his writing tackle a few austere chairs are placed about the books like the room afford little clue to their owner's pensions they are a most haphazard collection mainly yellow-backed novels picked up on railway journeys morris the jealous hoarder of invaluable medieval volumes is careless in the extreme as regards his modern authors and losing books is almost a habit with him his tastes moreover are by no means eclectic he is a rapid but not a great reader a chosen few in the world of literature are dear to him and all the others but so much empty letterpress milton he abominates wordsworth he detests in shakespeare he has no great interest for browning and tennyson twin idols of the period he has cared very little since his youth but keats keats for whom i have such boundless admiration and whom i venture to call one of my masters and to whom he closely approximates in the tone and quality of his work sits enthroned in his heart and among prose writers of the day he accords first place to carlyle and ruskin the latter he reveres as a truly great and wise master not only in matters of art but throughout the whole sphere of human life fiction does not greatly appeal to morris yet with that queer twist of the anomalous so often discoverable in men of great genius he has three favorite writers who are about the last people one could have guessed he is devoted to george borrow he is soaked and steeped in dickens and above all he is an enthusiast regarding the adventures of mr jorrocks this last is an inexplicable matter morris is no horseman he knows little and cares less about any sport save angling howbeit he has for many years in the moods when he was not dreaming of himself as tristram or sigurd identified himself with joe gargery great expectations or mr boffin our mutual friend to such an extent that his favorite salutations are quotations from these worthies and he insists on ramming jorrocks down the throats of his friends in season and out of season to their bewilderment and beyond entendu not infrequently to their boredom morris standing carelessly over his table sets down a few score lines the result of his morning's meditations he can write anyhow anywhere under any interruption the leisurely seclusion of the professional author has no charms for him his exquisitely beautiful calligraphy originally a slovenly and illegible scrawl is the result of years of work spent on illuminating and on the study of painted books of the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries it is now analogous to that delicate and marvelous detail 
that skill in the embroiderer's and the goldsmith's art which are so evident in the intricately wrought yet broadly designed effects of his verse the happiness of epithet and of local coloring which obtain in jason and still more in the earthly paradise the picturesque detail and the appropriate phrase which give life and individuality to his pictures are for the most part known only by their effects and only fully appreciated in the retrospect morris's greater poems are mainly unquotable because you must take them as a whole to detach a few lines from their context is equivalent to cutting away a piece of cornice to proffer as an example of a sublime cathedral for this reason he will never achieve the enormous popularity of such poets as tennyson or longfellow because to the average man or woman great architecture is less alluring than a small well-furnished house an impression of vastness overhangs and overawes the mind but little domesticities can insinuate themselves into its closest corners of william morris's earlier poems the defense of guinevere the haystack in the floods and the rest of that noble company it has been said that they seem to be lifted out of poetry to have besides poetry a substance of visible beauty of one particular kind to be partly without any notion of being poetry or effect or aim at it yet caviar to the general though the earlier poems may be who can shut his ears against the sensuous loveliness of such lyrics as that sweet song not sung yet to any man fragrant as a flower the water nymph's lullaby in jason i know a little garden close set thick with lily and red rose where i would wander if i might from dewy dawn to dewy night and have one with me wandering and though within it no birds sing and though no pillared house is there and though the apple boughs are bare of fruit and blossom would to god her feet upon the green grass trod and i beheld them as before there comes a murmur from the shore and in the place two fair streams are drawn from the purple hills afar drawn down unto the restless sea the hills whose flowers ne'er fed the bee the shore no ship has ever seen still beaten by the billows green whose murmur comes unceasingly unto the place for which i cry for which i cry both day and night for which i let slip all delight that maketh me both deaf and blind careless to win unskilled to find and quick to lose what all men seek yet tottering as i am and weak still have i left a little breath to seek within the jaws of death an entrance to that happy place to seek the unforgotten face once seen once kissed once reft from me anigh the murmuring of the sea and though no new poet be a prophet in his own country and though all great revivalists or reconstructors of an art must be prepared for initial doubtings and denials have not morris's mystical heroines nameless miracles of beauty out of fairylands forlorn a more subtle charm a more enduring sway than the everyday damsels of court or cottage who are celebrated by less imaginative makers to consider the earthly paradise that consummation of the vague and the mystical in form color and sound set forth in words of the most childlike simplicity is to hear and behold an endless procession a moving pomp 
like pageantry of mist on an autumnal stream gorgeous with blazonry of color and resonant with strange exhilarating music it is to listen once more with the wonder of a child to the old half-forgotten tales classical and medieval brought down into one's touch and sight it is the infusing of quick and throbbing vitality into the dry bones of dead romances and the opening out of new strange vistas into dreamlands that we supposed were irretrievable with the king having no name and needing none we sit breathless at the watching of the falcon till with a start he looked at last about him and all dreams were past for now though it was past twilight without within all grew as bright as when the noon sun smote the wall though no lamp shone within the hall then rose the king upon his feet and well nigh heard his own heart beat and grew all pale for hope and fear as sound of footsteps caught his ear but soft and as some fair lady going as gently as might be stopped now and then a while distraught by pleasant wanderings of sweet thought nigher the sound came and more nigh until the king unwittingly trembled and felt his hair arise but on the door still kept his eyes that opened soon and in the light there stepped alone a lady bright and made straight toward him up the hall in golden garments was she clad and round her waist a belt she had of emeralds fair and from her feet she held the raiment daintily and on her golden head had she a rose wreath round a pearl wrought crown softly she walked with eyes cast down nor looked she any other than an earthly lady though no man has seen so fair a thing as she we go roaming down with rodope to the iridescent ripples of the june sea and await some dim indefinable joy as when she stood to watch the thin waves mount her feet before she tried the deep then toward the wide sun-litten space she turned and gan to meet the freshness of the water cool and sighed for pleasure as the little rippling tide lapped her about and slow she wandered on till many a foot from shore she now had won the story of rodope or we cower with lawrence trembling in the shadows while the glimmering procession of the dead gods passes terribly from sea to land daring at all risks to recover the ring given to venus but william morris does not take himself at any exorbitant valuation whatsoever his hand finds to do he does with all his might and leaves it at that first in one art then in another he strives to find expression neither praise nor blame can cloud his vision of the ultimate end which he has set before him perhaps you think he told his mother once that people will laugh at me and call me purposeless and changeable i have no doubt they will but i in my turn will try to shame them god being my helper by steadiness and hard work and thus it is with no sense of instability or restlessness that he puts down his pen and proceeds to adopt another mode of expression it is simply a change in the material but not in the ideal of his art he runs upstairs and takes a glimpse of the river now fully ablaze with summer sunshine from the five windows of his great beautiful drawing-room which runs the whole length of the house this room is hung round with tapestry of his own weaving 
it boasts a great painted settle and other articles of furniture such as give it a unique touch of character and individuality among the conventions of the latter seventies it is one mass of subdued yet glowing color yet its chief perfection is missing in the shape of that stately and beautiful woman jane morris who is just now with her children away at kelmscott manor the human element is consciously lacking in this glorious apartment and morris realizes that for although he prefers men's to women's society and although his most intimate friend has declared that he doesn't want anybody he lives absolutely without the need of man or woman yet mrs morris is the very embodiment of her husband's most gracious imaginings and without her superb presence the house is but a tinkling symbol morris who ignores the existence of society who has never belonged to a club who with the true artist's impatience in small matters never knows how much or how little he has in hand is dependent upon the presence of his beautiful wife far more than he allows or is aware of now he is downstairs again and out of doors a chorus of sweet garden odors greeting him a long rambling garden runs behind the house with lawn and orchard and kitchen garden hammersmith is still but a suburban village quaint georgian unspoiled from all the flower beds of its little red tiled houses delightful midsummer fragrances float by the very barges as they pass along the river wear a holiday air and spread their great red spritzels like one who expands his breast to meet pure breeze morris betakes himself to his coach-house and stables which he has turned into a large weaving room for carpet looms during the previous winter he has been carrying on the weaving of figured silks upon a jacquard loom pile carpets upon this loom in the coach house and arras tapestry upon the one in his bedroom simultaneously and in addition to his works at queen's square where he dyes embroideries and silken fabrics he is also engaged in the initiation of or the execution of designs and fabrications in such works as painted glass tiles furniture furniture velvets wallpapers chintzes printed cottons and upholstery of all sorts not to mention a hundred projects of social reform begun or in progress an immense amount of reading in icelandic literature and a quantity of minor affairs connected with all the above such as few men could master or even attempt he is demonstrating au pied de la lettre the significance of that celebrated rule which he avows will fit the case of everybody have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful a good hearty breakfast including a tremendous quantity of tea is morris's next business in hand and he gives it the same thorough attention as everything else that he undertakes he has been likened to dr johnson for his inveterate love of tea drinking but he does everything on a big and expansive scale and at other times of the day he drinks other liquors with equal relish and smokes with supreme enjoyment the strength and vitality and strenuousness of the man are apparent through all the smallest details of his life he takes a robust delight in matters which to other men of feebler physique are incomprehensible he does not affect any lean and hungry aestheticism nor despise the pleasures of the table he is himself a good cook 
and an authority on cooking which he ranks among the fine arts whose fullness has been denied to women when out upon those angling excursions which constitute his brief respites from work he always will insist on cooking the fish he has caught and his tastes are typically english i always bless god says he for making anything so strong as an onion it may be indeed that morris's whole-hearted absorption in mundane matters as they pass beneath his notice his spacious huge delight in all things beautiful or desirable are after some abstruse fashion resultant from his haunting dread of death that passionate revulsion from and revolt against the thought of inevitable mortality which runs like a cold subterranean stream with perpetual shuddering undercurrent below his most opulent palaces of dream ah what begetteth all this storm of bliss but death himself who crying solemnly e'en from the heart of sweet forgetfulness bids us rejoice lest pleasureless ye die within a little time must ye go by stretch forth your open hands and while ye live take all the gifts that death and life may give the earthly paradise he has himself observed that perhaps change and death are necessary or there would be no good stories but this was a momentary outburst of philosophy far removed from his authentic feeling change and decay and death are altogether repugnant to him all that creates misery and poverty and hatred between man and man he loathes and while resolutely avowing himself a london bird its soot has been rubbed into me and yet doing his utmost to provide things beautiful in a commonplace and beauty careless age all the while this heavy boisterous overpowerful man is dreaming 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 my work he has confessed is the embodiment of dreams to bring before people's eyes the image of the thing my heart is filled with what is this image an earthly paradise neither more nor less a haven of peace and unfading loveliness a land of heart's desire immune from time and death the hollow land that prose romance which nobody having once read can ever forget closes upon this one great keynote of all his dreams where lover and beloved enter the hollow city through the golden streets under the purple shadows of the houses we went and the slow fanning backward and forward of the many-colored banners cooled us we two alone at last we came to a fair palace cloistered off in the old time before the city grew golden cloistered off from the eager leanings and brotherhood of the golden dwellings unchanged unchangeable were its marble walls whatever else changed about it we stopped before the gates and trembled and clasped each other closer for there among the marble leafage and tendrils that were round and under and over the archway that held the golden valves were wrought two figures of a man and woman winged and garlanded whose raiment flashed with stars and their faces were like faces we had seen or half seen in some dream long and long and long ago so that we trembled with awe and delight and i turned and seeing margaret saw that her face was that face seen or half seen long and long and long ago and in the shining of her eyes i saw that other face seen in that way and no other long and long and long ago my face 
and then we walked together toward the golden gates and opened them and no man gainsaid us and before us lay a great space of flowers such is the true ideal however impossible of attainment it may be perhaps it is all the dearer for that of this strange mass of contradictions william morris this combination of the ultra imaginative and the ultra practical constitutionally fierce and violent of temper he is constitutionally desirous of an ultimate and unending calm filled with the wild vigor and delight of battle he expresses himself in the most deliberately unemotional words you cannot guess whether he is putting a mighty constraint upon himself or fulfilling in the medium of sound and form his own conceivement of perfection you can only echo his mysterious music christ keep the hollow land all the summer tide still we cannot understand where the waters glide only dimly seeing them coldly slipping through many green-lipped cavern mouths where the hills are blue it is this blend of anomalies no doubt which makes the mind of william morris such a curious terra incognita to all those who have to do with him he presents to them so strange a union of aspects inherently antagonistic to each other that men regard him more as an elemental force dominating and inspiring them by dint of a powerful personality than one to be reckoned with as a human being the allurement of magnetic charm so often bestowed upon feebler intellects is in a measure denied to him he stands for an abstract influence rather than a lovable individuality that tremendous influence destined to permeate and revolutionize english and even european ideas of decorative art is only beginning as yet to make itself felt but morris's friends are vaguely aware of the urgent energy which drives him towards some goal unseen of them even as those filmy expressionless eyes of his are possessed of preternaturally quick sight far exceeding that of the average men so his abnormally acute mind with the prescience of true genius darts on ahead into regions caesar never knew and his most faithful admirers often have a sense of being dragged at his heels perplexed and out of breath they cannot hope to follow such sweeping swooping flight he is really a sort of viking says one of them set down here and making art because there is nothing else to do the trivialities and conventionalities of middle victorian london have absolutely no meaning for this master craftsman he belongs to some other sphere the morning is spent by morris at the carpet loom directing superintending or working with his own hands he allows himself a few minutes recreation at bowls in the garden but finds the sun too hot after lunch he is off to queen square to visit his dying works there and to look in upon his friends the faulkners not a day passes but he visits them matters of business must also of necessity be discussed always a tedious and impatient affair to morris who himself the very soul of honor truthfulness and justice detests any details of trafficking here you encounter more of his contradictory traits for human want and woe in the abstract he has the most passionate sympathy toward human needs in the concrete he is absolutely close-fisted do you know to quote rossetti's remark 
that topsy has never yet been known to give a single penny to a beggar upon all the exigencies and expenses of work he is ready to be lavish on occasion he will employ the almost unemployable without hesitation even as the while he expends himself and his own labor without stint but penury apart from the prospect of relieving it in mass finds no responding benevolence in him and of that reckless spendthrift habit so incident to men of great genius which finds a vent in careless extravagant charity he has not the slightest touch had today been wednesday morris by invincible habit would have dined with burn jones but it being only tuesday he betakes himself back home to hammersmith as the evening draws on a remarkable figure he presents among the fashionable frequenters of the west end as he strides steadily along the crowded streets in his soft felt hat and rough blue serge suit topsy according to his intimates dictum has an unlimited capacity for producing and amassing dirt and his appearance is unquestionably grubby he looks in consequence something between a working engineer and a sailor with a strong dash of the latter for whom he is occasionally mistaken and the unkempt picturesque slatternliness of the man is in keeping with either of these occupations so that there is really nothing outre about him it is only when very rarely he has condescended to assume the orthodox silk hat and frock coat that morris has candidly appeared ridiculous anything more bizarre than this conjunction can hardly be imagined he crosses the upper hall and regards with satisfaction his ugly georgian house ugly as it may show without he knows it is a treasury of beauty within a certain sense of emptiness strikes across his mind he remembers that the beautiful woman who rules these glowing rooms will not be there to receive him she whose portrait he has painted not on canvas as rossetti did but in lines of power and pathos praise of my lady my lady seems of ivory forehead straight nose and cheeks that be hollowed a little mournfully beata mea domina her forehead overshadowed much by boughs of hair has a wave such as god was good to make for me beata mea domina nor greatly long my lady's hair nor yet with yellow color fair but thick and crisped wonderfully beata mea domina heavy to make the pale face sad and dark but dead as though it had been forged by god most wonderfully beata mea domina of some strange metal thread by thread to stand out from my lady's head not moving much to tangle me beata mea domina beneath her brows the lids fall slow the lashes a clear shadow show where i would wish my lips to be beata mea domina he paces round the gardens noting with expert eye the growth and condition of their contents for he knows all the ways and capabilities of flowers vegetables and fruit trees which he studies with the fourfold interest of decorator poet earth lover and culinary connoisseur finally while dusk is drawing a veil over the river he enters his study and takes up with interest the manuscript he left unfinished at early morning he is absolutely free from vanity regarding his own productions in any kind 
eulogy is lost upon him. A task completed is un fait accompli, and must be judged on its own merits, which are not the author's. So he now observes of his poem, that's jolly, with entire simplicity and detachment. He determines to continue his work upon it after dinner. It is nearly midnight when Morris leans out once more from his bedroom window as he leaned at morning and drinks in deep breaths of the fragrant air. The wind sighs to and fro in the elm leaves, minutely plaintive, with a murmur of old, unhappy, far-off things, the only hint of sadness in all that overbrimming joy of summer. To Morris the wind has always held this sorrowful undertone, this wandering quest of something obscurely unattainable, as when it companions the night in his blossom burial of the beloved. I kissed her hard by the ear, and she kissed me on the brow, and then lay down on the grass where the mark on the moss is now, and spread her arms out wide while I went down below. Wind, wind, thou art sad, art thou kind? Wind, wind, unhappy, thou art blind, yet still thou wanderest the lily seed to find. And then I walked for a space to and fro on the side of the hill, till I gathered and held in my arms great sheaves of the daffodil, and when I came again my Margaret lay there still. I piled them high and high above her heaving breast, how they were caught and held in her loose, ungirded vest. But one beneath her arm died, happy to be so pressed. Again I turned my back and went away for an hour. She said no word when I came again, so, flower by flower, I counted the daffodils over and cast them languidly lower. My dry hands shook and shook as the green gown showed again, cleared from the yellow flowers, and I grew hollow with pain, and onto us both there fell from the sun shower drops of rain. Alas, alas, there was blood on the very quiet breast. Blood lay in the many folds of the loose, ungirded vest. Blood lay upon her arm where the flower had been pressed. Wind, wind, thou art sad, art thou kind? Wind, wind, unhappy, thou art blind, yet still thou wanderest the lily seed to find. The Wind But to-night the wind is claimant with subdued strange voices, music out of other times, such as that medieval minstrelsy which touches Morris as no modern music may. He stares with utter satisfaction into the opaque midsummer night. The whole world is spread out before his thought, visible, odorous, suffused with secret warmth and color, mapped out in exquisite uniformity of intricate form. Above him, the stars throb rhythmically. All is changed and altered. The night is lovelier than the day. It is as though the old earth and heavens are gone, says he to himself, and there are new heavens and earth. What goes on there? Who shall say, of us who only know rest and peace by toil and strife, and what shall be our share in it? Well, sometimes we must needs think that we shall live again. Yet, if that were not, would it not be enough to think that we helped to make this unnameable glory and lived not altogether deedless? And, not altogether deedless, of a verity, William Morris lies down and is immediately sound asleep. End of chapter 8 A Day with William Morris 
Recording by Lucretia B.